This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. All right, let's look at the uh, last question in section B of the paper F9 specimen exam. Look at the requirements. It's a 15 mark question. A, calculate the following share, uh, sorry, the following values for DD company. Number one, the ex-dividend share price using the dividend growth model. Three marks. Number two, capital gearing. Debt divided by debt plus equity using market values. Two marks. And three, the market value weighted average cost of capital. Again, two marks. So what? Three, seven marks there for the calculations, which we'll look at in a second. But then B, eight marks, so more than 50%, just over. Discuss whether a change in dividend policy will affect the share price of DD. So as always, you can't ignore the written. It may be hard to get eight marks out of eight, but there's no excuse if you're doing any studying at all for not being able to get a few marks. We'll discuss it shortly. But you know, you must make sure you at least get a few marks because however good you are at the arithmetic, it only needs a few things to go wrong, you know, and you're still only getting seven out of 15, even if it's right. And I've said all the way through, and I'll say for the last time, you've got to aim for at least 50% on every part of every question. If you can get 50% of every part of every question, you're going to pass. Anything extra you've done just makes it more and more certain. Anyway, that's one enough. Let's go straight to part A, the arithmetic. Have a quick look at what we've given. DD as a dividend payout ratio of 40%. Payout ratio, it means they're paying out 40% of their earnings as dividend each year. Uh, the current dividend per share is 50 cents. They expect that the next dividend per share is, will be 52 cents. They give us the capital structure. We've got there an extract from the statement of financial position, so equity, the share capital, the reserves, uh, the debt, the long term uh, finance, bond A, bond B. Bond A will be redeemed at prime 10 years' time and pay interest at 9%. The cost of debt is 9.83, market value 95.08. Bond B redeemed at par in four years' time, pays annual interest of 8%, the cost of debt is 7.82, next interest price, boop, boop. the cost of equity is 12.4. All right, let's work through and appreciate one, two, three. It may take us a few minutes, but keep your eye on the marks. You know, if part one was 10 marks, I'd expect to have to spend quite a long time, 18 minutes or so, it's three marks. You know, there's a limit how much time I'd be prepared to spend in an exam unless I've finished everything else. But it says use the dividend growth model. So straight from the formula sheet, P naught is D naught, one plus G over R E. Ah. Minus G. Write the formula down. Write it down. You probably get half a mark for that. Uh, but at least it's clear what you're trying to do. Uh, P naught is the market value that we're after, of course. But do we know these various figures? Do we know D naught? D naught is the current dividend. We do. Second sentence, it's 50 cents. I always work the whole thing in cents. Do I know the growth rate? No, I don't. But I do know um, what next year's dividend is going to be. It's going to be 52 cents. So surely the growth rate, it's going to go up by 2 cents, 50 to 52, on an existing 50. I don't need a calculator. It's 4%. 
Um, now, really, we need to know that's what you might call the long term growth rate. But since they does say they've been maintaining uh, a standard uh, payout ratio, so they're always retaining, they've got the similar dividend policy. Uh, it does imply that I would expect the growth to continue at 4% a year. Finally, RE is the return to shareholders, but the same as cost of equity. We given in the last line of the question 12.4%. So it's now a pure calculator exercise. If I work in cents, D0 is 50. 1 plus G, 1 plus, sorry, 1.04, divided by RE 0.124 minus 0 0.04, which comes to 50 times 1.04, divided by 0 0.084, gives me 619 cents, appreciate, because I've got the dividend in cents, or $6.20 per share. Uh, better just check, did he want it per share? Yes, he wanted the X dividend share price. Uh, P naught, sorry, the formula gives you the X div price. Uh, had he wanted the total market capitalisation, uh, you'd have had to multiply by that, that by the total number of shares in issue, but not here. So that's OK. And then part one. What about part two? Capital gearing using market values. And he has defined it. Now, I do stress in my lectures, and do read carefully, gearing can be measured in two ways. Sometimes we measure it as debt divided by equity. Other times, debt divided by debt plus equity. They give different figures, but they're both valid. But he always says which one he wants, and here he specifically wants debt divided by debt plus equity. He wants us to use market value, so uh, let's work out. First of all, what's the market value of the debt? The debt of these two bonds. So bond A, on the statement of financial position, we've got 20 million, but that'll be at par or nominal value. The market value, beneath it, it says bond A, current X interest market is 95.08. So the market value is 95.08 for every 100 nominal. The market value, therefore, 19.016 million. In a similar way, what bond B? Uh, the total market, uh, sorry, the total nominal or par value on the statement is 10 million. The market value, bond B, the current X interest market price is 102.01 .01 for every 100 nominal. And therefore the total market value, well, I don't need a calculator for that, it's 10.201. So the total market value of debt is 29.217 million. What about equity? Um, from the statement, uh, the share capital is 25 million. The dollar shares. So We've got 25 million shares. The market value per share, well, of course, we're not told, but we did work it out in part one. The market value per share is $6.20. Total market value, 
155 million. That can't be right. Is it? Yes, it is. 155 million. Now, two things before I finish it off. One is, a lot of people want to add on reserves. The reserves are 35. No. If we were asked to calculate um, things using uh, balance sheet values, stem to financial position values, then of course, on the stem to financial position, the equity in total is worth 60. But when we're using market values, which is what we normally are interested in, the market value includes uh, reserves. You know, the most obvious reason of all why the market value is higher than the nominal value of the shares is because they've made profits. They've got retained earnings reserves. And so market value of the shares automatically includes all the retained earnings, includes the reserves. We don't add it on. So now it's simply a question of sticking it in the expression. The debt 29.217 divided by debt plus equity which is rather than me risk it, I keep making mistakes. I can't do anything right at the moment. Uh, 15.86%. There we are. That's part two of the gearing. <coughs> Okay, finally, part three. Oh, actually, I said there were two things about part uh, two, and I only mentioned one of them. Uh, one was about the reserves, so I'll repeat it. The other is, though, um, the market value per share of 620, we needed it, and that came from part one. And so, of course, if you'd have made a mistake in part one, you know, suppose you got five dollars a share by mistake, then automatically you would have a different answer for part two. You don't lose marks twice. If you made a mistake in part one, you'd have lost marks, depending on how big the mistake was, you know. Arithmetic, perhaps half a mark, if it was more serious, one mark, two mark, whatever. But however many marks you lost in part one, you would get full marks in part two for using the figure you got from part one. So you see, if I got five dollars in part one and I use five dollars here, obviously I end up with a different answer. But if I've done all my workings right otherwise, I would get a full two marks for part two. Provided it's clear what you're doing. You know, my answer is right. But even if the 620 had been wrong, my workings are clear enough, it's obvious that I'm doing it right. I'd get full marks of part two regardless. You know, that's why it's so important to be reasonably neat in part B. And the same applies to part three. They want the weighted average cost of capital. Well, we are going to be using figures that we'd already calculated. Even if they were wrong, it doesn't matter as long as it's clear what I'm doing. The weighted average would take each source of finance. We've got equity. Uh, we know what the cost is. It gives it us. The cost is 12.4%. And the total market value. Ah, I only worked it out per share. Oh, no, I didn't. We were judging total there, didn't we? It's 155. Um, each source of finance, so bond A, the cost that gives us is 9.83. The total market value I just worked out for bond A is 19.016. 
And finally, bond B. Uh, the cost is 7.82. Again, we just worked out the total market value as 10.201. Okay, so now back to a pure uh, calculator exercise, we take a weighted average. The total market value of all the borrowings... Oh, I've actually worked that out as well, haven't I? 184.217. And so to get a weighted average, well, equity, 155 out of 184.217 times 12.4%. I'll do the multiplying in a moment. But bond A, 19.016 out of a total of 184.217 times 9.83%. And finally, bond B, 10.201 over total 184.217 times 7.82. Actually, if you're very good with your calculator, you could effectively... Multiply by 155 and 19 and 10, and then only at the end divide by the total. Doesn't matter. I'm mean, sorry, but it's up to you to be efficient with your calculator. If I do them individually, though, I get 10.433. One point zero one five point four three three, and so the total of the weighted average cost of capital Eleven point eight eight one per cent. I would personally, I'd usually leave that to two decimal places. I put eleven point eight eight per cent. I don't know what the examiner's done, um, but that would I'd always get full marks unless he'd specifically said to the nearest percent or D no, or if he'd specifically said to three places. But I don't think he'd do either. There we are. Uh, yet again, that's taken me quite a while for seven marks. In the exam, though, uh, I would find that very quick. The, the, the only time that should really be taken up there is just reading the information. But, you know, if you've read the requirement first, uh, you waste less time because you know basically what you're after. Uh, the arithmetic itself, well, by the time you go into the exam, I think everything there should be very automatic indeed, uh, and very fast. I say the time. You've got to make sure the arithmetic you can all do quickly. Uh, that the only time you're taking is the time it takes to find the relevant figures. Anyway, finally, part B. <clears throat> it's eight marks. So they actually want quite a lot, but as always, of our talk uh, for a few minutes. I'm not going to write a full answer, read his answer and learn from it. And again, appreciate he writes more than he expects from you in the exam. But discuss uh, whether a change in dividend policy will affect the share price of DD. Now, it's standard stuff and it's dealt with in the notes. In theory, the answer is no. This is Medigliani and Miller, really. Uh, Medigliani and Miller said that dividend policy didn't really matter. Uh, uh, sorry, I hope you know what we're talking about. You know, at the moment, they pay a dividend of 40% of earnings. What happens in future if they pay a higher dividend or lower dividend? Well, Medigliani and Miller said it doesn't make any difference. If a company decided to pay a lower dividend, not because they've made less profit, that's not dividend policy. But if a company decides to pay a lower dividend, it means they're retaining more of the earnings. And more, if they retain more, they can invest more. And that should lead to growth in the future. And shareholders, sh it shouldn't matter whether they get 
low dividends with a lot of growth, high dividends with very little growth, it shouldn't make any difference. Um, if shareholders are getting a low dividend and want more, they can sell some of the shares. So in theory, dividend policy is irrelevant. In practice, though, it can have an effect. Uh, it does matter to shareholders. You know, you have got some companies that pay very high dividends but don't grow much. And other companies that pay very low dividends, but because they're investing a lot, expanding, they grow a lot. And shareholders choose what they prefer. You know, perhaps old people would rather have a high dividend. They're not worried about growth. They want high cash. And they invest in that sort of company. Whereas other people, younger people, perhaps because they're earning um, a salary, they've got jobs, they're not so much worried about the level of the dividend each year. What they want is growth. And they choose that sort of company. And so whatever the theory may say, if a company changes, you know, if I've invested in a company paying high dividends, no growth, because I want high dividends. It's no good the company saying, oh, we're going to pay you a low dividend and don't worry. It'll grow. Well, if I'd have wanted that, I would have invested somewhere else. And that really is the clientele effect. Uh, and investors often choose where they invest because of the dividend policy. In which case, they are not going to be happy if the policy changes. And if they're not happy, it does tend to affect the share price. Now, I don't know, I probably said that far too fast. If I did, look at the notes, read it. Because although it's certainly not something that would be asked every time, nothing is asked every time, really. Um, it is fairly standard. It's something it does stand to ask every few exams. Uh, and it's something to a large extent you can learn. Good. That's a question. Well, that's the whole exam finished.